Thank you for joining us here on Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And every week we invite you to send in your stories, your questions, things that you're curious about and want to learn more about, and we'll explore the fascinating story of the city of Mississauga together. Our first question this week around uh, Lake Wabakane and uh, what is it named for? And uh, First of all, Lake Wabakane is a man-made lake in uh, northwestern Mississauga. In its original form as a lake, it was a cattle pond on the Cook family farm. Um, but the lake itself, uh, again, it was it was man-made, uh, first in 1946 by, by a local farmer um, and uh, uh, later through the development process creating a, uh, a water control uh, dam and uh, uh, a lake that's to uh, trap runoff and uh, help filter the water before it enters into the Credit River watershed. Uh, there is a natural creek through the area which was the source of the uh, the original source of water that created the lake when the, when the farmer put the dam through and that was known as Wabakane Creek and so Wabakane Creek predates the lake itself. Um, modern Lake Wabakane uh, and the surrounding park were uh, constructed in 1976 by Cadillac Fairview as part of their Air Mills development, pl uh, Air Mills development plan. Um, Lake Wabakane uh, in its size is 1.3 hectares um, and it's again a stormwater management pond although it takes advantage of, a, of a quite a stunning um, scenery if you will or, or landscape features and it's built again on that cattle pond which was a result of damming uh, what was formerly known as Wabakane Creek. Historically, the name Wabakane is believed to come from Chief Wabakanine of the indigenous Mississaugas. He was one of the Mississauga uh, uh, chiefs of the Eagle Clan at the Credit River who signed treaties 13 and 13A in 1805. Wabakane translates as white snow. It's unknown when and why the original creek was named, um, although uh, it uh, the name was in place prior to 1920, and so we're not, not sure exactly when it took its name. Um, Lake Wabakane itself uh, was uh, located on what was formerly the Peter Cook Farm, uh, which was uh, uh, settled uh, settled here in historic Mississauga as as uh, early as 1829 um, when the Cook family arrived, um, and uh, so the family continued on the property for several generations, um, and uh, uh, they were involved in the surrounding area, including up in Streetsville. They were involved with the Loyal Orange Lodge um, and some of the churches in Streetsville. So quite a quite a, a rich history that is recorded on the Cook Farm itself. Um, and uh, Peter's 100 acres uh, of his farm went to his youngest son, John Albert Cook, in 1889. Like his father, John Albert was also a successful farmer. Uh, in 1900, John Albert had a new farmhouse built, um, not too far away from where Lake Wabakane is today. Uh, John Albert passed away in 1937, and the farm passed to his son, Elgin Roy Cook. Um, and uh, he inherited the farm in 1942. The farm, uh, uh, some livestock on the farm, and they grew wheat, oats, uh, seed clover, barley, and then raised beef cattle as well. Um, Roy and his eldest brother Clarence Cecil uh, are the ones who built the dam across Wabakane Creek in 1946 for the cattle pond. Um, and uh, the uh, the area itself was well known amongst the, the locals, a kind of a favorite swimming hole at times as well. Roy Cook passed away in 1964 and the family continued to live on the farm until 1976 when the property was sold and the original farmhouse and, uh, and barns were demolished. Uh, the lone remnant of the Cook time period on this property is uh, what we know today as Lake Wabakane. Roy Drive in nearby Vista Heights is uh, named in honor of Roy Cook. So uh, to answer your question in short, uh, Lake Wabakane takes its name from Chief Wabakanine, whose name is believed to translate as White Snow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart, for your question, and uh, it uh, the answer to it really depends on which school you're looking for, and uh, there was more than one. Uh, and so tracking that information down is a little bit of a challenge. So you follow the story a little bit because there there are kind of a, a number of threads here in terms of the different schools that uh, called the historic hamlet of Burnhamthorpe home. 
The first schoolhouse at Burnham Thorpe uh, was a one-room log schoolhouse and it was built sometime prior to 1845, somewhere between 1841 and 1845, we believe. Its exact location is unknown. Um, it was not given a school number designation that came along a little bit later on, but it was believed to have been located immediately north of Burnham Thorpe Road, possibly beside the surviving uh, church, the former Burnham Thorpe Methodist Church, which is a Romanian Orthodox Church today. Um, uh, it's possible that that first schoolhouse was located somewhere in the vicinity of uh, that surviving church. We are not sure. Uh, the second schoolhouse at Burnham Thorpe, uh, which was the first one to carry the designation of school section number eight or SS number eight, was a one room wood frame building. Uh, it was built in 1854, just south of Burnham Thorpe Road and south of the surviving cemetery, which is at the corner of Burnham Thorpe and Dixie Road. Um, this uh, building, after it had been uh, succeeded by a, another schoolhouse, this original frame a one room schoolhouse later became a steam power powered uh, sawmill uh, and so continue to serve the, uh, the community in different capacities uh, over time. The third schoolhouse, the second one to bear the designation of SS number eight, was built immediately to the south of the second schoolhouse. This is when it gets confusing, kind of have building after building after building. So if you think about the intersection, uh, at one point there was the cemetery on the southwest corner. Immediately south of that was the second schoolhouse and immediately south of that was the third schoolhouse building. Um, and so the, the, uh, the third schoolhouse building uh, was built of brick um, and it was originally a two room building. It was built in 1883. And sometime right around the beginning of the First World War, perhaps just before the First World War, the school was enlarged by an additional two rooms at the rear, so creating what was then a four-room schoolhouse. And this building survived until 1928 when it was, when it was torn down. Uh, the fourth schoolhouse uh, was built on the, on, on the same location as the previous schoolhouse or the third schoolhouse. So it was built on the same, so this is the first time in our story, the four schools, only two of them occupied the exact same piece of property. Uh, the fourth school was built on the same site as the third SS number eight uh, in uh, 1928. It was a larger school and it functioned as such until 1965. Uh, there was reportedly a formal uh, closing ceremony, a formal closing ceremonies held in August of 1966. In 1966, the uh, students from the former SS Number no. 8 school were transferred to a new school built nearby on Golden Orchard Drive, and the old school building um, was leased to the Toronto, uh, Toronto French School between 1966 and 1970. From 1970 to 1972, the building was shared between the Toronto French School and the newly created Burnthorpe Branch Public Library. The Toronto French School left in 1972, and, in 19, and until 1974, the old schoolhouse served only as the library for the community of Burnhamthorpe. Um, and uh, it also, in 1973, it housed two overflow classrooms from the school at Golden Orchard. This building, the uh, the fourth uh, Burnhamthorpe uh, Public School, and the third school, uh, the second school on that exact site, uh, was demolished in 1974 to make way for the Burnhamthorpe Branch Library Building, which, although much altered and renovated, survives today on the southwest corner of, uh, of Burnham Thorpe and Dixie Road. So a long history of usage on that site, uh, multiple schools, multiple historic schools located therein. We have pictures of several of the early schools, but we do not have a picture of the very first school there. That, and its location again is, is not exactly known. Um, so uh, a, kind of a meandering story of schoolhouses located in the historic community of Burnham Thorpe. But thank you for the question. Thank you, Vanessa, for your question on uh, on Old Cherry Hill and uh, the Duke of Marlborough pub. And I well remember the pub as well. Myself and many of the people I've talked to over the years have, have fond memories of Cherry Hill through its different incarnations over time. Uh, but to your question on the history, uh, Cherry Hill is, um, and the Silverthorne family, are amongst the best documented stories of historic Mississauga. There's a great deal of information assembled, not only in the house, but of the family who once lived there. The original Cherry Hill house, um, not the house you see today. Uh, it was a simple log cabin, likely about 14 feet by 22 feet in, in, uh, in size uh, from some of the early descriptions we have of the building. 
was built between 1807 and 1808 by 20-year-old Joseph Silverthorne. Uh, Joseph and his 15-year-old bride, Jane Chisholm, uh, and her family hailed from the Oakville area, uh, had recently arrived uh, and uh, together with uh, Joseph's parents, uh, John and Esther Silverthorne, and Joseph's older brothers, uh, Aaron and Thomas. Um, and they all settled nearby between, uh, kind of between Cothra Road and the Etobicoke Creek area was where uh, many of the Silverthorne uh, farms were located. Um, the Silverthorne family themselves had come up from New Jersey in the United States uh, in uh, the late 1790s and had brought, uh, reportedly brought cherry trees with them uh, and whenever the family moved or established new property it said that the saplings or cuttings from the original cherry orchard in New Jersey were brought with them hence the name Cherry Hill referencing cherry trees that were planted along the laneway leading to the, uh, the, the house and barn on the property. Um, as for the Silverthorns themselves, again, Joseph, uh, together with his wife Jane, uh, they arrived in historic Mississauga in 1807 after receiving a 200-acre land grant on the north side of Dundas Street and just to the, uh, uh, the west of what is now Cothra Road. That was their, uh, their acreage. Um, and again, the, the property to the name Cherry Hill takes its uh, reference from the cherry trees that were planted along the laneway. Uh, although a main portion of Cherry Hill as we see it today was built around 1822, the stone or rear portion of the building is believed to be older and possibly dating between 1816 and 1817. The, this building in its, uh, in its combined dates, if you will, the one that survives today, replaced the earlier log cabin. Um, and again, it's believed to be built between uh, 1816 and 1822 as a larger home for Joseph and Jane's growing family. Uh, Joseph and Jane were amongst the earliest settlers in historic Mississauga and they lived in this house for well over 50 years of married life. Um, it's a fine example of a, of a neoclassical structure, uh, a large gracious home for its time period. Um, and uh, to quote one description of it is gracious proportions and the balanced placement of the elements give the house a dignity and charm. What a lovely description that is. Uh, Joseph, and uh, uh, Joseph and Jane Silverthorne had three sons and nine daughters, one of whom died uh, in, in infancy. Uh, Joseph and Jane died within months of each other in 1879 and 1880 um, and after a long, long married life together. Um, and the property was inherited by three uh, unmarried daughters, uh, Janet, Helen, and Augusta. Augusta was the last to, uh, living daughter of that family and she passed away in 1907 and left the property to a favorite nephew who was an actor in New York. His name was William Stanislaus Romain Walsh. Uh, Stanislaus was an actor again, as I, as I mentioned, but was rarely in historic Mississauga. The house fell into disrepair and was lost to the family due to unpaid taxes during the Depression. Um, the house uh, remained an occupied home uh, and uh, right up until uh, the late 1960s uh, fell into a state of abandonment um, uh, at that point. Um, the house was saved by the developer S.B. McLaughlin um, and uh, under the direction or under the, the understanding that this is one of the most uh, one of the oldest houses to survive in Peel County, which it is, uh, and it was worth the effort to preserve it. And so in 1973, the house was moved, uh, put up on on, on on a trailer and moved northward to make way for road widening improvements uh, in the area. And in 1979, Cherry Hill once more opened its doors uh, to the public, but this time as a restaurant. And it's had different iterations of the restaurant over time, and this is where the Duke of Marlborough plays in as the pub that was located in the basement at uh, Cherry Hill for a time. Um, there's lots of ghost stories around Cherry Hill, but that perhaps can be a, a story for another episode, or perhaps something we can chat about around Halloween or so. But Cherry Hill, one of the, the uh, most uh, uh, significant heritage buildings in our our community. It's also one of our earliest designations within our community under the terms of the Ontario Heritage Act. Cherry Hill was designated back in 1978. Uh, for you, anyone interested in learning more about the Silverthorns, uh, there is a lot out there. It's well worth a read if you're interested not only in this specific family but also the experiences of those early settling families who kind of helped shape the community around them.
them. I recommend uh, The Silver Thorns of Cherry Hill by the late Kathleen Hicks, uh, a tremendous book just on the family of, uh, of the Cherry Hill House and some of the fascinating stories therein. And Kathleen also wrote uh, another book on it, on the, on the Silver Thorns, The Silver Thorns, Ten Generations in America. Uh, again, a remarkable story with with uh, many many generations of the, of the Silverthorn family. Even living descendants remain in our community to this day. Um, Silverthorn fam Silverthorn name has. Uh, um, uh, Kind of scattered across North America. There are Silverthorn references in California and Cleveland and Chicago, uh, in Toronto, Etobicoke, here in Mississauga, uh, all connecting back to the uh, this this early settling family, and of course down in Niagara uh, as well. The many Silverthorn references therein. Uh, again, one of our our better documented uh, early settling families here in historic Mississauga. Uh, and it's a remarkable story to tell the the early challenges they faced uh, some of which were just you know the distance from neighbors uh, uh, distance from family from support networks a scarcity supplies it's reported uh, in their story that Joseph was regularly gone for six weeks at a time either having to go to Toronto on foot or all the way to Queenston and Niagara on foot to either connect with family or gather supplies um, infant mortality like like many life was uh, a challenge uh, medical and doctor uh, medicine and doctors were were, were scarce um, they lost one daughter uh, just under a year of age uh, her name was Callista in 1826 uh, War of 1812 impacted the family as well not only did Joseph serve in the War of 1812 with the with the uh, embodied militia his brothers uh, Aaron and Tom Thomas also served and Thomas being wounded in in the war so you know challenges that were not unlike others around them but certainly something to reflect on when you look at the story of, of this family uh, they interacted with indigenous peoples um, they're said to trade uh, 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 harvested materials uh, with those of the indigenous peoples for things that they both required there's a reportedly a great respect and understanding between Jane and uh, some of her uh, indigenous neighbors if you will um, they helped to found the silver thorns helped to found Dixie Union Chapel and Cemetery in 1810 helped to build the first chapel in 1816 probably had a hand in the second chapel which survives today which was built in 1836 uh, and again the silver thorn name found in many places not not only here locally but uh, abroad as well. I'm always amazed by their story of sheer perseverance and the challenge that must have come in this early landscape of, of, of raising a large family. They had 12 children, uh, Joanna, Catherine, Esther, uh, George, Janet, Jane, Elizabeth, Callista, who died young, Joseph William, Helen, Theodore, and Augusta. Um, but just a remarkable story. And again, for anyone looking to read more, I, I, I do recommend um, uh, the, the Silver Thorns of Cherry Hill by the late Kathleen Hicks. Hi Elizabeth, thank you for your question. And uh, I, I, I'll, I'm not entirely sure who you're looking for, but my, my first guess uh, and, and a likely candidate falls on artist Clara Harris, who did paint in the Meadowvale area of historic Mississauga. Um, Clara was born, uh, Clara Isabel Perry in King City, Ontario in 1887. Uh, Clara Isabel Harris, uh, who lived between 1887 and 1975, studied under J.W. Beattie and exhibited alongside other uh, uh, talented Canadian artists, including A.J. Casson, Owen Staples, and Fred Haynes, all of whom also painted in the Meadowville area and in historic Mississauga. Clara painted and sketched at Meadowville, um, and uh, uh, several buildings which still survive were, were painted by, by Clara, including the Meadowville Mill, which was painted in 1939. She was a prolific artist um, and uh, left over 300 paintings uh, as, as her collection of works, if you will. Uh, in 1907, Clara studied at the Art Institute of Chicago, later attending the Ontario College of Art. Um, and uh, she, her contemporaries uh, and uh, those that uh, uh, she painted alongside and, uh, and uh, were you know, influenced by and perhaps she influenced their work uh, included uh, members of the Group of Seven um, and other artists, George Agnew Reed, Manley MacDonald and William Crookshank. 
Uh, she exhibited early sh uh, at various shows very early on, uh, the 61st Annual Exhibition at the Ontario Society of Artists in 1933, um, and uh, the Ontario Soci uh, the uh, Art Gallery of Toronto uh, in 1943, for example. When Claire was 31, uh, she married to uh, Frederick Harris, also a commercial artist, and they lived in Toronto. Uh, they shared their love of art as they traveled through Ontario, Western Canada, the Canadian Maritimes, and the, uh, the United States Northeast. Uh, their sketches, uh, paintings, uh, greeting cards, and correspondence uh, all connect to this love of landscape and the, these travels that the, the couple went on. Much of Clara's work can be found at claraharrisart.com, www.claraharrisart.com. Thanks to the extraordinary efforts of curator Verna McLean. Um, if you go to the website uh, and the about section and the history section, there's a great story there of how this uh, collection of work came to be. And I won't preface it here, but uh, Verna has done an incredible, uh, incredible efforts in terms of bringing Clara Harris's uh, incredible collection of artwork uh, back into the light, if you will, and sharing the story and the talents of this incredible, uh, incredibly prolific painter. Uh, Clara, Clara was an accomplished artist um, in a world that was largely reserved for men at the time. Uh, consequently, Clara's work, like most of her contemporaries, accumulated in out-of-the-way places, uh, often less, less than ideal conditions, and was rarely seen, remained relatively unknown, and was often undervalued. But she was prolific. Uh, and she recorded landscapes of yesteryear, including several from historic Mississauga, uh, notably in Meadowville Village. And uh, Clara, uh, Clara's work is exceptional. I do, again, recommend uh, anyone interested in learning more about Clara to visit uh, www.claraharrisart.com.